He recommended the captain to receive a promotion to Brigadier General. The promotion was endorsed by Washington, and it became official on June 29, 1863. This let him leap over captains, majors, and colonels. Custer was only 23 years old, and he fancied himself with a crimson tie, a broad-brimmed hat, and a black velvet jacket that radiated gold braid. This made him an easy mark for enemy sharpshooters, but Custer thought that men should be able to spot their general on the battlefield. That, with his distinctive curls and his uniform and his blonde mustache, they certainly could. Custer's command was the 2nd Brigade of the 3rd Division of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac, consisting of the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Regiments of Michigan Cavalry and a battery of artillery. He led these men into battle at Gettysburg with the cry, Come on, you Wolverines! His first charge at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863 was repulsed by Wade Hampton's men. But Custer, whose horse was shot out from beneath him, was cited for gallantry by his commander, Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick. On the next day, the day of Pickett's Charge, the fateful event in which Confederate soldiers were absolutely mowed down by the Union, Kilpatrick's men were ordered to shield the flank at the Little Round Top. Custer, however, was attached to the command of General David McMurdy Gregg, whose men were in place to protect Meade's rear from Jeb Stuart's cavalry. They had the same undefeated aura about them as the infantry of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. The fighting had already grown hot when Custer was given the orders he wanted to lead a charge into the enemy. The honor fell to the 7th Michigan, Custer's most inexperienced troops. The blue-coated cavalry charged into Confederate shot and shell and crashed into an intervening fence, which didn't inhibit hand-to-hand fighting with sabers, pistols, and carbines between Virginians and Michiganders. The Federals were driven back, but reformed themselves to meet a Confederate countercharge. Now at the head of the 1st Michigan, his best regiment, Custer thrust his sword in the air and shouted, Come on, you Wolverines! The clashing opponents collided with fury, horses tumbled over each other, and this time, through the gun smoke, the point-blank discharges, and the clanging, it was the Confederates who pulled back. The shock of many, the Virginians had been stopped. Custer wrote in his report, I challenged the annals of warfare to produce a more brilliant or successful charge of cavalry. And you could see this either as bragging, or you could see it as boyish enthusiasm on the part of the very young general. And this is how Custer pursued a lot of his endeavors, with spirit and pluck and enthusiasm. Custer maneuvered friends and family onto his staff or into his units, including his brother Tom. And if it was nepotism or cronyism, it was cronyism that at least had some meritocracy that rewarded the brave. His brother Tom won the Congressional Medal of Honor for his bravery at Sailor's Creek. He was shot in the face and survived to fight again, so it's not total cronyism. Custer married Elizabeth Bacon in 1864 after her father, Judge Daniel Bacon, couldn't keep the boy general from his daughter. As the son of a blacksmith, the Custers were the Bacon's social inferiors, and Custer had a reputation as a ladies' man, but at least now he was a general, not a blacksmith. And for all intents and purposes, it seems that they had a happy marriage. And his well-bred pious wife followed Custer to camp whenever it was considered safe to do so. On one occasion after the war, while on the Great Plains, he was court-martialed and suspended from duty for a year because he decided to swing by and visit his wife while on a campaign. Jeb Stewart kept his wife away from camp, thinking it no place for a lady, but Custer welcomed his wife and thought Stewart's flirtation with other women along the campaign trail was no behavior for a husband. In March 1864, Custer fell under the command of Phil Sheridan. Sheridan also respected the manner of Custer's command. He was as eager to fight as Sheridan was. As an aide to General Meade noted, fighting for fun is rare. Only such men as Custer and some others attacked whenever they got a chance and on their own accord. And it gained him a reputation. When Libby was introduced to President Lincoln in Washington, the president replied, When Libby was introduced to President Lincoln in Washington, president replied, so this is the young woman whose husband goes into a charge with a whoop and a shout. Custer continued fighting throughout the Civil War through the Battle of the Wilderness, Trevilian Station, Yellow Tavern, where Stuart was struck down, the Shenandoah Valley, and the final campaign at Appomattox. Custer's star rose even higher as he closed out the war a major general of volunteers and a brevet major general in the regular army. He was only 25 years old. Custer still had Southern sympathies and Southern friends, so he was magnanimous in victory. But he defeated them, and in his mind he thought they deserved to be defeated, 
but he didn't believe that they should be abused after the war. He had his band play Dixie after he captured worn-out gray troopers near the end of the war, and he became a political ally of President Andrew Johnson against radical Republicans who thought that the South should suffer punitive damages. Custer was aligned with the Democrats, and he was winning himself political enemies at this point. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. After the war, Sheridan was able to keep Custer gainfully employed and brought him to Texas. But that assignment was temporary, despite Sheridan's best efforts. The War Department reduced Custer in rank to captain and assigned him to the 5th Cavalry. Custer wanted to find something better. Ulysses S. Grant wrote a letter of recommendation for him to become a mercenary general in the Mexican Army, but Custer's application for leave was denied. Still, Custer hoped something would turn up, and it did, to become a lieutenant colonel in the 7th Cavalry, which at least had the promise of adventure, as the 7th was posted on the Great Plains. Into the 7th Cavalry came his brothers, Tom and Boston, a nephew, Audie Reed, and a brother-in-law, as well as such men as Captain Miles Coe, who had fought for the Pope in Italy, Lieutenant Charles DeRudio, who had fought against the Pope as an Italian nationalist, and Captain Lewis Hamilton, the grandson of Alexander Hamilton. He was surrounded by friends, but also a few enemies, like Captain Frederick Benteen and Major Marcus Reno. Sharon wanted to directly fight the Plains Indians, and he sent Custer out to destroy any hostilities. Sheridan's Indian policy was harsh, but to his mind, he thought it was realistic. He said, The more we can kill this year, the less we'll have to be killed the next year, for the more I see of these Indians, the more I am convinced they will all have to be killed or be maintained as a species of paupers. And Custer executed this policy. And this is part of the reason that he has a negative legacy, because he was part of a brutal campaign to destroy Indian culture and seen as the enforcement arm of the worst parts of Manifest Destiny of destroying American Indian culture for the purposes of westward expansion of the American government. Custer saw the barbarities that justified it. He wrote about child rapes and murders of abducted white girls by Indians, disemboweling of children, and how... American Indians had broken their promises to the American government. And of course, we know the opposite event of the broken government promises to Indians. He also saw the Indian Bureau as corrupt. And Custer, of course, was a romantic, and he relished living and fighting among the Indians. In some senses, he was sympathetic to their plight. He conceded and he wrote down that they were savage, and he rejected the idea of them being noble savages, but he believed that they could be civilized, Christianized, and he repudiated any talk of exterminating the Indians. So sad to say, but this is something of a progressive position if you're talking about officers who are fighting on the frontier. He went further and stated, if I were an Indian, I often think I would greatly prefer to cast my lot among those of my people who adhere to the free open plains rather than submit to the confined limits of a reservation there to be the recipient of the blessed benefits of civilization with its vices thrown in without stint or measure. So it's a little bit too simplistic to talk about Custer as a crazed Indian killer, but he had no problem fighting Indians on the plane, and he respected their plight and thought that he would be doing the same if he were in their position, but he wasn't, so he executed this policy and for the most part, thought that Indian culture was irredeemable in the light of the 19th century and the advancement of the United States and believed that they needed to fundamentally change. So there's a lot of ways to see him positive and negative, and this is where the complexity of his legacy comes in. Well, the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer's last stand, is really, I think, what Mars' legacy. Let's jump to the Battle of Little Bighorn, and then we can talk about Custer's legacy. First, I'll mention what the Battle of Little Bighorn was, and then we'll look at some eyewitness accounts of the battle itself. So this battle is also known as Custer's Last Stand, and it was an armed engagement between the combined forces of the Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, and the Arapaho tribes and the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the U.S. Army. The battle happened during the Great Sioux War of 1876, and it took place on June 25th and 26th along the Little Bighorn River in the Crow Indian Reservation in southeastern Montana Territory. The U.S. Cavalry Force had 700 men, and they suffered a crushing defeat. Five of the 7th Cavalry's 12 companies were annihilated. Custer was killed, as were his brothers, a nephew, and a brother-in-law. 
The total U.S. casualty count was 268 dead and 55 severely wounded. The battle happened in the context of a sun dance gathering. Among the Plains tribes, there was a long-standing ceremonial tradition called the sun dance, and it was one of the most important religious events of the year. It was a time of personal sacrifice on behalf of the community. In 1876, the Lakota and the Cheyenne held a sun dance that was attended by a number of Indians who had slipped away from their reservations. During the sun dance, around June 5, 1876, Sitting Bull, who's a spiritual leader among the Lakota, had a vision of soldiers falling into his camp like grasshoppers from the sky. At the same time, the U.S. military was conducting a summer campaign to force the Lakota and the Cheyenne back to their reservations, using infantry and cavalry to push them back. So this was part of the military campaign happening. With the Battle of the Little Bighorn, when army was moving into the field on its expedition, it incorrectly assumed the number of Indians it would encounter. They thought that there were no more than 800 hostiles in the area. The Indian agents based this estimate on the number of Lakota that Sitting Bull and other leaders had reportedly led off the reservation in protest of U.S. government policies. But in fact, Custer would face thousands of Indians, and all Army plans were based on the incorrect number. So Custer was severely criticized after the battle for not having accepted reinforcements and dividing his forces, but he simply wasn't prepared to contend with 1,500 to 2,500 warriors. So what happened was that Custer spotted a Sioux camp and decided to attack it. But because Indian forces outnumbered his troops three to one, Custer and his troops were forced to reorganize. While waiting aid from the other cavalry forces, another group of Indian forces, led by Crazy Horse, effectively trapped Custer and his men. In a desperate attempt to hold off the Indian warriors, Custer ordered his men to shoot their horses and stack their bodies to form a barricade to protect them from the Indians. But after only an hour, arrows and bullets from the Indians wiped out Custer and his men, even though he won the battle. The problem is, the accounts we have aren't very clear of what happened because everyone was wiped out from Custer's party. And the precise details of the fight are conjectural. None of the five companies under his immediate command survived the battle. The later accounts that we do have are from surviving Indians, but the accounts can be conflicting and unclear. So the hilltop that Custer had moved to is probably too small to accommodate all the survivors and the wounded. This was called Last Stand Hill, where the soldiers put up their most dogged defense. According to Lakota accounts, most of the casualties occurred in the attack on Last Stand Hill more than anywhere else, and the extent of soldiers' resistance showed that they had few doubts about their ability to survive. According to Cheyenne and Sioux testimony, the command structure rapidly broke down, although smaller last stands were made by several groups. By almost all accounts, the Lakota annihilated Custer's force within an hour of engagement. David Humphreys Miller, between 1935 and 1955, interviewed the last Lakota survivors of the battle. He wrote that the Custer fight lasted less than one half hour. Other accounts said the fighting lasts only as long as it takes a hungry man to eat a meal. Lakota said that Crazy Horse personally led one of the largest groups of warriors who overwhelmed the cavalrymen in a surprise charge from the Northeast, causing a breakdown in the command structure and panic among the troops. Captain Frederick Benteen, battalion commander of companies D, H, and K, recalled his observations on the Custer battlefield on June 27, 1876. I went over the battlefield carefully with a view to determine how the battle was fought. I arrived at the conclusion I hold now that it was a rout, a panic, until the last man was killed. There was no line formed on the battlefield. You could take a handful of corn and scatter the kernels over the floor and make such lines. There were none. The only approach to a line was where five or six dead horses found at equal distances, like skirmishers, that was the only approach to a lion on the field. There were more than 20 troopers killed in one group. There were more often four or five at one place, all within a space of 20 to 30 yards. I counted 70 dead cavalry horses and two Indian ponies. I think in all probability that the men turned their horses loose without any orders to do so. Many orders might have been given, but few obeyed. I think they were panic-stricken. It was a rout, as I said before. Well, it took days for the account of the battle to reach the wider American public. The Bismarck Tribune had a complete version of the massacre, but it couldn't produce the details until days after the battle. The Bozeman Times ran an extra with the story on July 3rd, and then the AP got the story on July 5th. General Sheridan and Sherman dismissed the first report as a rumor. They thought that the scale of the massacre was implausible, and they generally distrusted the press, 
and they noted that Custer had been falsely reported dead many times before. But official word relayed 